All right, so we'll do our intro really quick and then and then we'll get started if that's cool. Absolutely. John, do you want to do anything before or do you just want me to go right into uh, it? Eric, what do you happen to know? And what I guess when I'm saying Eric, I'm talking to you, Eric Vale, and not our Eric. <laughs> if this is going to be a nightmare. We should maybe call me Wadi because I go by Wadi a lot. Oh, that's a great idea. I was going to insult you by saying other Eric. <laughs> oh, but, <yes>. um, <laughs> but, <laughs> I don't care what you call me. You can call me names. Okay. Fair enough. Do you have to know anything about this? Or you saw your name and then also Dragon Ball Z and you're like, I have to be on there now. This has to happen. Well, I saw Eric hates Dragon Ball Z. My wife and I were walking around. I'm like, that is hilarious. And I just wanted to know what it was. And when I found out what the podcast was, I'm like, I want to do it. So no, I actually have no idea. I'm a bad researcher. I haven't researched it at all. I'm Perfect. coming in Dude, totally No cold. worries. There's very yeah. little to research, so. Yeah, there's not okay. a whole lot. You're no missing out on it. At all. <laughs> You're really not. Yeah, I have an analogy for you. So we are like the Whataburger of podcasts. Depending on where you're from, a lot of people will have no idea what it is at all, but it's pretty good. Okay. Second thing I did want to mention, we swear a lot, just FYI. Is that a problem? Oh, no. <laughs> I know. I know. It's just courteous to ask. My daughter literally on the car ride home caught me swearing, and she was like, don't say that. I'm like, I was whispering it to myself under my breath while she is listening to EDM. I'm like, how did you hear? Did you hear? So no, I'm fine. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Welcome to Arcade's Dragon Ball Z. I'm Spencer. I'm John. I'm Eric. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should clarify. I'm the one who hates Dragon Ball Z. We're excited to welcome Eric Vale to our podcast for this very special interview episode. Thank you. You might know him as the voice of the world tournament announcer from the entire Dragon Ball series, right? It's kind of amazing. Yeah. Also trunks, but much less important. Not so. nobody cares about trunks. <laughs> World tournament announcer, man. That's where all the money's at. <laughs> <laughs> Have you done that voice for Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, and Dragon Ball Super, like recurring throughout the series? Or yep. has it only been Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z? That's amazing. Everything, man. I was. I think I got the voice of the announcer because they didn't have any actors back at that time. That's 20 plus years ago. They needed it done and we were always behind the gun. And so somebody was like, well, I have Eric do it. What were you doing at that time? Trunks. Wait, really? Like, yeah, I got Cass's trunks first. Wow. So I went to college in Denton, which is just north of Dallas. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's when I got Cass's trunks. But it was also when I got suspended from college, <laughs> like at the same time. Like, what do you mean suspended? I got I failed Spanish twice. And apparently <laughs> you can't do that or they kick you out of school and they kicked me out of school. And then oh. three weeks later or something, I got the audition and then auditioned two, three times or something and then got the voice of Trunks. And then I was doing Trunks for, I would say, six months plus and then started doing the tournament announcer, too. And that was like 22 years ago. There is no world tournament announcer surrounding the Trunks saga, like where he's involved in Dragon Ball Z. Right. Were you dubbing Dragon Ball at the same time as Dragon Ball Z was coming out? Or is yeah. yeah, we were recording everything simultaneously. At the time, there was one booth at this building and it was in the basement. And then they moved the booth upstairs to the offices and opened up two, three more booths. And then we could do more shows. And that's crazy to think that Dragon Ball was being dubbed at the same time as Z. Yeah, yeah, it was. So I've got a couple questions for you that I'm very curious about. Sure. Do you have a most phoned in line reading? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The thing I do at conventions for people who when they put a quarter in my ass and tell me to dance like a monkey. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, do you have like a thing that they ask you to do most often? Not a thing that they ask me to do, but people generally speaking, you know, and people are super cool, but generally <laughs> speaking, they will get up to the front of the autograph line, right? And then freeze. It happens all the time. And they're like, I I had this specific line I wanted you to say, and I forgot what line that was. So can you just say something? That's usually <laughs> how it goes. They get super nervous, oh, and they're just like, say anything. And I am, by nature, an asshole. <laughs> I'm an older brother. I act like that toward everybody. So I'll do that to the fans, too. And then I'll usually ask him their name and then say something that makes fun of them in Trunks's voice. Wow, that's amazing. They absolutely love every second of it, I'm sure. Oh, they do. They do. It's cool. And I and also, I but I do have those go-to rote lines that somebody's like, say something, Trunks. I'll say, you're about to find out what it's like to fight a real Super Saiyan. Happy? 
<laughs> oh, that's awesome. That happy. Was it ever like fun for you to to have the quarter in your ass or was it has it always been? I imagine after so many years it kind of gets a little old. But. I mean, yeah, it gets a little old, but it's still fun, you know. Now I just have the balls to say to somebody, put a quarter in my ass and I'll dance like a monkey. <laughs> I try to keep it fun, and I think everybody knows when they meet me in person, they understand I'm just fucking around. Sure. Some people don't get the joke, but I can't explain humor to everybody. <laughs> yeah, you can't make everybody happy all the time, right? It's like any job. You know, it's it's great. I don't want to go to work sometimes. You know, sometimes it's annoying. Sometimes I work with people I don't like. Sometimes I work with great friends. It's, you know, pretty standard stuff. How much do you work with other people? Like, again, just personal curiosity, but is it just, do you get a script and it's just you and a booth and then everybody else kind of goes interchangeably so you don't get a lot of interaction with other people? Yeah, that's 100% the way it works. Okay. Like, literally, I'm, I work right where you see me right now, like every day. Nobody's doing in-person stuff anymore. I, next week, I'm going to shoot a commercial and it'll be my first in-person acting job for uh, over two years. Wow. You know? So mostly everything's here. And, you know, I do a ton of other voiceover too, not just the anime stuff. And I record mm -hmm. everything here. I don't go into studios anymore. But we never, with anime, you never work together with other actors. You're always working together with directors and engineers and stuff, right? So you develop those relationships. But because it's, it's not prelay animation like The Simpsons, where, where you can record all of the voices in one room together, all the actors at one time, and then the animators will work on the mouth animation around mm -hmm. the performances. It's the opposite of that. Animation's already done in Japan. It gets here. So it's a dub, right? And I got to match the animation that already exists. And to do that, to get those audio files clean enough so that you can manipulate it and make it sound natural, the actors record alone. So Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And while we're talking about it, I promise we'll get to the, the fun stuff in a sec. This isn't fun? No, no, it's super, <laughs> it's like clinical almost. All right, all right. We're just going yeah, through the paperwork. The questions you've been asked a million times already, so yeah. let's cut this body open. <laughs> John and I have talked about it a lot because our podcast is just us reviewing Dragon Ball Z and then we bring Eric in and he hasn't seen any episodes really. And we just kind of explain the story to him as it goes along. So funny. <laughs> so I'm curious about a couple things. Number one, I guess, since we're like right on the, the subject, how much do you actually know about Dragon Ball Z? Because it sounds like from when we first met at the Fanex in Salt Lake, mm -hmm. you don't watch the show. No. And haven't like ever? No. That's amazing. Yes. That's, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't I don't watch any of the anime. I don't watch any anime at all. Wait, but you used to, right? I mean, of course I did. You know, like, yeah, I did. I grew up watching anime. Man, there was this uh you guys actually rem remind is part of the reason like when I when I met you guys, I was like, "Holy shit, cuz you guys remind me of these dudes I used to watch anime with back in college." <laughs> so, like, I'm old, man. I'm 47, you know? <laughs> and so I grew up in the 80s watching Robotech, right? Mm -hmm. And prior to Robotech, I, I remember in kindergarten watching Star Blazers and Battle of the Planets, right? That was huge shit when I was a kid. When I got off to college in uh, 90, fall of 92, I was at Southwest Texas State, in s just south of Austin, right? There are these dudes who lived in this house right outside of the city limits, and they had all this bootleg anime on VHS tapes that had no subtitles. It was just the anime, you know, in Japanese. And we would go over there and watch it for hours and hours on end. <laughs> and we wouldn't even know the names of the shows that we watched. <laughs> and we had a blast doing it. And I was still watching. I would go see midnight showings of uh, Ghost in the Shell at the Inwood Theater in Dallas uh, oh, by myself cool. because... You know, had no friends. And then in college, I was dating this girl. She was really into anime, so we would hang out and watch anime. And I was dating her when I got cast as Trunks. And so that was weird because it felt like, um, now I'm going to watch the stuff that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I think you, well, at least I learned very quickly that's not the way that it was going to play out. Especially because at the time, what ended up happening is I was doing voiceover. Within about six, eight months, I realized there was more work opportunities so that I wouldn't have to keep delivering pizzas. So I got hired on as a writer at Funimation. I was a head writer up there for about 10 years. So as a head writer, I was directing shows and acting in them. And after doing that all week long, man, the last thing I wanted to do was pop on anime. 
to relax, sure. you know? So I, I didn't. And that's why you guys broke up? Oh, that girl? <laughs> yeah. No, no, she was just not my type, <laughs> ultimately. She was sweet. I liked her a lot. She was great, but it was never going to work out. Oh, so, okay. And I <laughs> yeah. knew that for a long time. And then broke up with her, and then I think I was dating my wife within like three, six months. Oh, that's awesome. You know? Oh, yeah. So it was supposed to happen. But I Absolutely. have to ask. Did you ever did you ever end up using the trunks voice oh. for her? And you know what I mean. Oh no. You know what I mean. <laughs> no, no. I mean if I if I didn't want anything, yes. Oh. No, she she is um the opposite of a fan. <laughs> and I, oh wow. She's, oh, wow. So she's a, an hour, Eric. Bye, bye, she's sweetie. Yeah. Okay. That was her. <laughs> that was my wife. <laughs> no, no, not at all. She she's uh I was saying the opposite of a fan is not true. She's she worked at Funimation too. She worked there in subtitling. Oh. She was in a few shows. She was in Gunslinger Girls. She was actually in My Hero recently too. Oh, but wow. um, cool. it's shop talk. And no, she would never want me to use that voice. She doesn't even want me to use my voice. <laughs> oh. Okay. You use your skills to sound like someone other than yourself. I try to. Yeah. All the time, actually. <laughs> okay. So back into the shop talk. You get an episode that's been done. It's in Japanese. You said you're a head writer. What the? Mm. What does that mean versus subtitling versus voice acting? Like, so I used to be a head writer. I, I, not right. for a lo- not for a long time, but for about ten years, I was a head writer. And what that meant was, it's an assembly line thing. You have the anime that comes in, and then you get a translation that comes with it. And that translation does not work. You can't just read the translation. You have to do something to it. So mm-hmm. you have a time coder who goes through and time codes the script for every single moment that an actor will have anything to say. So you get this time coded script with anywhere from one to 300, 600 lines, right? And it's all in a table format. It was my job, like say, if I'm a writer, then it's my job to take the translation and put it in the script where all the dialogue goes. Then watch the show and adapt the dialogue to an English-speaking audience, which means you got to know how Japanese translates. And Japanese translates usually backwards. I mean, you think of their names, right? In Japan, your surname comes first. When their language is translated into English, a lot of things are reversed. So like a punchline will happen before the joke. Which that is sounds hard wild. to yeah. fix. Yeah. So you've got to sit there and you've got to spend all this time fixing all these things and making sure that everything works and sounds good, is telling the story, make sure that the dialogue is honest to the original Japanese intent, make it dramatically appealing to an audience. But like, how much leeway do you have? Does Akira Toriyama call you up and just say, this doesn't work with the original? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's different now. But at the time, I had a script supervisor who would review my scripts. Okay. Once they got rid of the script supervisor position, then I was made a head writer and there were three head writers. And then it was my job to review all the scripts that my writers were working on, as well as write my own, but still review their scripts and make sure, does this match this enough? Okay. Is it telling the story enough? I would have to know these things well enough to know, like, is this character coming back in 10 episodes as a bad guy? Like with One Piece. You'd have to watch mm. One Piece 30 episodes ahead to know, Oh my God. does Man A2 come back as a bad guy in 30 episodes? And that happens a lot in one piece. So you would have to know that so that you could give these notes to the directors saying, cast a good actor in this room. <laughs> cast somebody that you trust to deliver a performance in 30 episodes. You have watched a lot of anime then. It's just like you're oh, yeah. being paid for it. Oh yeah. I've watched more. I've watched enough anime. I don't need to watch anymore. You yeah, know, that makes sense. and and people like when I'm working with people, they th- they think it's magic. Like part of the job is to be able to cold read, to be able to get your script and read it perfectly on the first take. Right. Because we're cooking through this stuff so fast. Well, there's a lot of new people coming in now, a lot of new directors, new engineers and stuff. And I will nail a line the first time with the intent and they'll be like, wow, how'd you get that? God, you're, it's a miracle. I'm like, it's not a miracle. It's like seeing the matrix. Like (laughs) I've watched enough anime. I know the formula. I know, I I know what's going to happen here. It's, it's just time invested. It's not really a skill set. 
So you're Neo. I'm I'm fat Neo. <laughs> <laughs> We planned on watching History of Trunks, the TV special, because yeah. that's oh, cool. the next up in our podcast. We're going to review that next. Kick ass. And I noticed I had the Japanese subtitles on. There was like long periods of silence in the Japanese version where in the English, there would just be dialogue, 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 dialogue. Right. Like, do you have permission just to add shit anywhere where there's silence? Not anymore. We did then. Okay. Everything changed. And like the market for anime changed, right? Like. If you look back in five-year increments, the pop culture popularity of anime in America is just Yeah, increasing. it's insane, right? Like, mm. nerds are taking over the world. Absolutely, basically. absolutely. But what nerds want more than anything is specificity. They want exactly what the meaning is. I mean, we've had big drama about this in the industry over the past few years with people adapting things and people saying that certain writers were putting in language that furthered some agenda. I don't know. I didn't pay much attention to it. Wow. But I knew that it happened. So like a long time ago when we were working on that, the producers that we had told us they don't want all this space, right? And I mean, this is 15 plus years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't want all this space it needs to be filled up for the american audience kids specifically right and so we would fill it up with dialogue that seemed in tone with what was happening nowadays luckily everything changed so that you really just do what the japanese company intended and when you do that now you don't have to fill in all these gaps with a whole bunch of extra dialogue. So you think that's the better approach? I wouldn't say the easier approach, but it's the approach that honors the original intent best. But that said, I, I gotta say, some of the best stuff that I ever did creatively was that, was the in-between things. Like, I don't know if y'all know a show called Desert Punk, but we did... Oh, also have loud-ass dogs. Uh, so we did Desert Punk years ago and i was the head writer and then got cast as desert punk and we would spend time just writing jokes there's one scene you know the big thing that jawas work in that big yeah land the sand rubber. crawler yeah, yeah yeah so it's like a sand crawler yeah but it's like fast right mm -hmm. and these dudes attack it and there's this moment where these two guys are hanging off their strings just hanging there and we're watching them and we're like why are we watching these guys like there's no dialogue here so we wrote dialogue for these two goons. <laughs> we called them Goon A and Goon B, and we had them refer to each other as Goon A and Goon B. <laughs> I remember the joke, because we were working with this engineer who doesn't work with us anymore. She was super funny. That morning, she looked up at us, me and the director, Jeremy Inman. She goes, hey, does coffee make y'all poo? And we're like, yeah. She's like, oh, good. I don't know why that struck us as funny, <laughs> but we made these two goons say that to each other. I get it. Wanting to do a one for one when you dub something like an anime, getting the exact translations. But like that shit, that's awesome. I love the creativity, like letting it shine. And especially when you're making something for an American audience, like it's different, right? I think I think it hits yeah, different if you sure. do an exact translation versus like. I, I agree. And I mean, look, I run a comedy troupe. We do you know, all that kind of stuff. I think I'm hilarious. Some people don't. <laughs> My wife, not necessarily. It's easier to make comedy in these sessions. Because like I was saying, you know, it's just me and an engineer and a director most of the time. And luckily, you'll be able to see them out of the corner of your eye usually. And now doing it like this, I can't see that. So working on comedy remotely is not awesome. But at least there you have a two-person audience. So if you say something that's funny, they'll laugh. And if you say something that's not funny, they won't. So I had much better time doing the comedy stuff. It's just more reciprocal. Circling back to Dragon Ball Z. So you know what goes on then. Like, you know Trunks' story and all that stuff, even though you oh, haven't yeah. watched it in your free time. Every season of Dragon Ball Z, we say, hey, Eric, this is the season of Dragon Ball Z we just watched. Uh -huh. And when we got the Trunks, we had this gimmick of, hey, Eric, you're the head writer now. <laughs> like, this is what, these are kind of bullet points of what has to happen. Uh -huh. And you can fill in the gaps. Yeah, I, I wrote you out of Dragon Ball Z. Sorry about that. Yeah, I still have a place to live, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I 
literally did absolutely nothing to affect you as a person but um, didn't even know until this moment yeah <laughs> but it is hilarious to me that the only character that eric has uh written out of existence is the one that agreed to do our podcast for some well, reason no that sucks <laughs> yeah yeah come on eric but <laughs> the hell but i i wrote a different character and want to offer that part to you it's actually omalo so it's it's, it's Bulma's it's what? Bulbalo. It's Bulma and Piccolo's offspring that comes from the future. <laughs> Today at the con, I almost took a picture of this. I didn't want to insult the artist. We were in Artist's Alley, and there was a picture of Piccolo and little Goku, and it was the only picture in the everything must go bin. Like, <laughs> like, oh my God. Like, all these prints, just five bucks. I'm like, yeah, because nobody fucking likes them. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. They don't know who you are. You could just offer up a little bit of constructive criticism. I don't know, man. That was at the point that everyone was like starting to recognize me and I had to get out of there. <laughs> Is it weird to go to an anime con as like not a guest? Like, do people recognize you and stuff as you're just walking around? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, that, that, uh, that, that one yeah. word said so much. That happened, mm -hmm. and look, I, it doesn't bother me at all. You know, it, it'll happen a few times. It's not a big deal. Like I told my wife earlier, it's a little bit easier <laughs> when I've got my daughter with me because then I can be like, "Oh, hey, uh, I'm sorry, I'd love to do this, but I, I'm dad right now." You know, and so I had to right, yeah. pull that a little bit today. But I forget things like when somebody hollers my name to not look at them. And so I was walking out today and I heard somebody go, oh, Eric Vale. And I just turned and I'm as my head's turning, I'm like, you fool, what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, yeah, it happened a little bit, but mainly because of my hair now. I thought like I'm masked up. Mm -hmm. Nobody, I didn't know anybody could tell who I am. Yeah, from this. it's kind of amazing. But apparently my hair now gives me away. Have you had the style for a long time? No, no. Like just post pandemic, my wife was like, don't cut your hair, keep it long. And sexy and stuff and i'm like I'm, I'm none of that apparently the long hair is a thing it is totally a thing it, it looks real good yeah not that she didn't look good before it looks real good i like now. how the Thanks. one person verifying this is the one with no hair <laughs> <laughs> yeah that might have something to do with it i don't know thank you i appreciate it but i i didn't count on that today and then it happened multiple times does it happen in like a wave like if one person does it they hey yeah that is eric vale yeah that's anything? exactly what happened i so the guy who was running this con is uh john swayze who uh plays all for one in my hero right oh. and he's a good friend of mine and he uh texted me i was shopping with my daughter and he's like hey if you're here still somebody wants to uh say hi to you at my booth and i'm like okay cool i thought it was like a friend but it was just somebody who saw me and went, that's the guy who plays Shigaraki and I want his autograph. And so I show up and it's this young woman and her, her young daughter and they were both super cool. And I took a picture and I signed an autograph and chatted with him for a second. And then when I turned around, there was a line oh, of no. people <laughs> waiting with things for me to sign. And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, so. Do you feel like you've adapted to fame well because you're incredibly famous in a very niche area where these people are super passionate that's about that's the thing it's that niche area you know i can still be a regular dad i could still go to the grocery store nobody knows who i am when i go to the movies or, or, or mm -hmm. whatever I, it has happened that i've gotten recognized but it's very very rare but i don't know that i'll ever get used to it it's a weird thing to have a whole bunch of people feel like they know you yeah when mm -hmm. they don't at all yeah the parasocial aspect yeah it's like y'all don't know what my farts smell like <laughs> i do <laughs> my wife does my kids unfortunately do but how much would it cost for you to like offer a fan that fart smelly sort of personal i, I don't think there's a price <laughs> that's my private farty <laughs> life <laughs> i do want to ask you what <laughs> What you hate most about Dragon Ball Z. Oh, okay, finally. <laughs> You've been in the show for a long time. Waiting. Obviously, this show is called Eric Hates Dragon Ball Z. We want to know what Eric Vale hates about Dragon Ball Z. Chris Sabat. <laughs> oh, yeah, him? Yeah. He's the absolute worst. Just the voice actor for like the two most popular characters, Vegeta and Piccolo. And, and of course, he pretty much gave me my career. 
<laughs> and is one of my closest friends and lives right down the street. But he's the worst. But yeah, fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Sab and I are super tight, right? He did cast me as Trunks and taught me voice acting. And we're still buddies. And we were at a convention a few years ago <laughs> up in Alma, Michigan. And these guys who run the One Piece podcast, they were there doing interviews. And then I get back to the house that we're staying in. There was, it was this house at this university. And they are shooting video of him interviewing him on a couch, right? And at the end of it, they have been handed a piece of paper. There was this other press guy who was there. And he's like, I don't want to wait for Sabbat to get ready. So here's my questions. Y'all just ask him and then send me the video. <laughs> what? <laughs> And then the dude bailed and I showed up when they're finishing the interview with Chris. And then they're like, this guy handed us this paper. And so I'm like, roll camera. And I took the paper and sat down and I interviewed Chris. Oh, holy shit. Is this the, is this the parody video with John dug, dug this up a we couple days ago? Watched that. Is that real? Is that how that came about? Yeah. Where, where he and I are sitting on a couch and I'm like, hi, uh, welcome yeah, to my uh -huh. interview. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That I literally walked in, saw it, and that guy had interviewed me a few hours earlier, and it was not awesome. And I'm like, "Fuck this, let's go." And I sat down, and we did that. And yeah, dude, that was it was hilarious. That that video was like, okay, these are the questions that we don't want to ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but to circle back, what do I hate? What do I hate about Dragon Ball? Yeah. It's hard to say that there's anything that I hate about it because without it, I wouldn't have a career, yeah. you know? But I can say that there are things about it that I don't like. And what I don't like is the idea that I am the character. When people approach me, they're like, like today, this kid, and he was a sweet kid. He, he was too young to know any better. <laughs> However, this happens from 30 year old men as well. But this kid comes up to me and he's like, he's like, hey Trunks, Hey, Trunks, how's it going? And I'm like, hey, buddy, how are, how are you? And he's like, so how's your dad? How's your dad treating you? How's your dad doing these days? And I'm like, well, he's the worst dad in the universe. So that's my answer. <laughs> so there you go. And, and, you know, he and I talked for a second. He was a sweet kid. Like I said, he was young. But there are people who are with their children who do this to me. And I'm like, you can treat me like the human being I am. And then ask me about the character, but pointing to me and treating me like I'm the character is a little problematic for me, you know, sure. because I am not a time traveling guy <laughs> and cannot <laughs> wield a sword. And while I also have a very problematic relationship with my father, that's none of your business. <laughs> Holy shit. You are on the perfect podcast. I seriously. Yeah. We've talked about John's dad a lot. <laughs> And yours. It's weird to me that Funimation didn't foot the bill for a sword training session or two yeah. before you took the role as Trunks. That would have been nice. Yeah. You yeah. know? It's like the first thing he does. Yeah. I'm kind of amazed that you have... I mean, I, I guess I'm not amazed that there are fans out there that um, act that way. But especially with anime. Like, I can almost connect the dots for an actual physical, real person that plays a live-action yeah. character. Yeah. But voice acting, like... No offense, man. You don't look a thing like Trunks. No, I don't. However, people are like, now that I have long hair, they're like, oh, you have Trunks hair. I'm like, no, I just have hair. My hair is way too Afro-y for, for Trunks. It's super thick and and, and, and voluminous. Who knows you know? when you go Super Saiyan, you could be the spitting image. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> So you said you're you're very close with Christopher Sabat. Yeah, yeah. He's your dad in the anime. In real life, true, yeah. <laughs> do you use that relationship, the Vegeta and Trucks relationship, as a roadmap of what not to do with your kids? Are you kidding? Uh, let me tell you a little story. So I have two kids. My son is 29. He's a teacher. He's also an actor. He does work at Funimation as well as a lot of theatrical work. The kid's like getting some serious traction. He just won best director at the Austin 48 hour oh, video race. And wow. so, and he, he, he was a quarter finalist in their screenplay competition at Austin Film Festival. I'm like, holy shit, man. <laughs> so he's doing that and his life is, is, is trucking along. My daughter is 15. She's in the other room. You might hear her hollering out a little bit here or there. My daughter's on the autism spectrum and we've known that 
most of her life, right? So becoming a special needs dad very quickly became my whole life. So that's why I like to do things like I did today, like spend some alone time with her, take her to the convention, you know, show her around to people, you know, see some of our friends that she hasn't got to see in a long time, maybe a few years now. And she's super great, man. But autism is hilarious. <laughs> okay. And that's something that people don't want to talk about is that you you got to find humor in all of this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so our lives being neurotypical are hilarious sometimes. And some of the things that we do are hilarious. And so, of course, some of the things people on the autism spectrum are going to do are hilarious. My daughter, today, we go to this con. There are people wearing costumes everywhere. There's cosplay all over the place. All different kinds of cosplay. So my daughter having a perception issue. There's a communication issue that she has. She's very smart and she's very fun, but she does have a little language difficulty with communication. She has input difficulties. So I learned today, she has a hard time telling who's in cosplay and who's not. I go up to the green room with uh, a couple of actors, take my daughter up there. We have a little drink, have a snack and I'm like, all right, we got a little snack in us, Lily. Let's go back downstairs and do some shopping. Okay, Dad. So we go, we get on the elevator, and there's this woman already in cosplay on the elevator in the back corner. And there's this other couple standing next to her. And then me and my buddy Jeremy get on. Uh, Jeremy and the director from Desert Punk, like I was saying. And Lily. And we're standing there. And we're talking, just blah, 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 blah. And then it goes down a couple floors, door opens, and this older dude gets on steps on and my daughter looks at him points at him and goes i hate this old man <laughs> oh yeah what was he dressed as he's not dressed as anything he's going to the gym he's just an old dude going to the gym oh. he's like got a t-shirt and shorts on he's just an old guy and he's like what <laughs> and i'm like oh fuck you know how do i deal with this Luckily, the dude was cool. He's like, oh, I hate myself sometimes, too. He was like <laughs> oh, wow. super cool. Just freaking rolled with it. Like I got home and I told my wife that story. And I'm like, I, I don't feel embarrassed a lot. Living your life like in like a public way. Yeah. You kind of get over things like embarrassment. But I remembered today what it was like. <laughs> I don't know why I got I'm sorry. I don't know why I got started on this story. I just thought it was hilarious. No, that's a great story. Yeah. Um, and, and speaking of, uh, John, did you have, I, I thought you had something squared away in your notes there for, I want you to know what my notes are. It says Eric Vale, Whataburger, Chariot. Chariot! Which I haven't gotten to ask about actually yet. I didn't oh! get to ask about Chariot. So everything that I've heard Kick about ass. Chariot, and I, I should ask you, how do you feel about how that turned out? Cause I know you wrote the script for it. Pissed off. Really? Fucking angry. Yeah. First off, have, have y'all... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You've opened all the wounds, yeah, man. No, no, no. Shit. My phone's... my my. So I live in the 1980s where I still have a house phone. Oh, wow. Oh, which you okay. can hear ringing in the background. My wife, my wife, my wife. <laughs> she will not get rid of the antiquated things of the past. We still have a house phone. She writes everything down on paper. And anyway... <laughs> It's a whole other problem. Okay, so first off, I'm super proud of Chariot. The feature film came off exactly the way that I wanted it to. I got to work with a great cast and crew, wonderful people. So yeah, I wrote and produced it. So I was on set every oh. day. And the guy who directed it is a good friend of mine, still a good friend of mine. What happened with... and Yeah, and there's a lot of people who are like mad about the ending or, or whatever. Is that what you were talking about, John? I have no idea. I've only <laughs> seen a bunch of reviews, and you know how the internet right. works, so I don't listen to any of them. Yep. Fuck it. I just see the stars. That's it. Broad stroke it. <laughs> so I guess none, nobody's seen Chariot here, right? Not yet. Right. I think we're going to no. have to. I didn't now. have enough time. It's not going to offend me. The short version is seven people wake up on a plane with no idea how they got on board, and they got to figure out what's going on. That's it. The whole thing takes place on a plane. I am historically terrified of flying. Hmm. So what I did is I took a little part of my personality and used it to invent each character in the film. 
Yeah, that's pretty good. Oh. You know, the ending is a kind of a cliffhanger ending, which is my kind of my favorite stuff. What ended up happening is the film got stolen from us. Wow. So when the film was finished, we had signed with a distribution company. The distribution company that year alone stole 14 films from 14 different filmmakers. What do you mean stole? Stole. So here's how it goes. I signed a representation agreement, which is kind of like they rep our film to be sold into certain markets, right? And then at the end of the feature film, when the movie was done, we gave them the deliverables, which is the finished film, Mm -hmm. all of the media that we shot, everything that we shot for promotions, all of that stuff goes to them. They took that film and then sent it up to this shit production house up in Canada that wiped out everything and then released the DVD in Walmart only. And we never signed out for that deal. So I kept talking to this dude, talking to this dude, what's going on? And eventually that dude vanished. Vanished. The three guys who were that production company splintered. One of them disappeared forever and no one has ever found him. Oh, like the mafia got to him? It's kind of like that. And you find out in the film industry, this stuff is common. So they'll, these guys will come in, they'll talk all this big shit, and then they'll get the deliverables, they'll get the film, and then they will push it out in all the shadiest ways possible, take all of the money, and never give you your part. So I hired this bulldog attorney. For about three years, he and I chased these people down until we found one of them. We found him because he had to post that he was getting married. <laughs> <laughs> And where he was getting married. So I got my investors all of their money back. They were paid in full because I finally got money from this guy. I never made a dime off of it. So it was a terrible experience for me on the back end because the thing that was this labor of love that I really thought was going to help a filmmaking career exploded right in my face. Wow. That sounds seriously terrible. I'm kind of bummed out that you didn't just show up to the wedding. Like, where's my foot? <laughs> I, right yeah. Right then, there. Me too. I actually <laughs> talked to my lawyer and I'm like, like when we, when we found it out, because he and I sort of had two pieces of the puzzle and put it together one day. And I'm like, I know where his wedding is. I know what date it is. I'm going to buy a ticket out there and I'm going to show up to his fucking wedding <laughs> while he's walking down the aisle and go, give me my goddamn money. <laughs> And the lawyer goes, or (laughs) you could let me do the thing you pay me for and I'll get you your fucking money. And he did, man. That guy kicked ass and got us the money. So that was it. That was why that movie was disappointing. It wasn't the production. It wasn't the finished product. It was what happened with distribution. Wow. That's yeah, that's the shit story. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> Has it burnt you out on on trying again? Or are you really pushing forward? It, like, okay, it totally, it totally burned me out, man. Oh. Until now, like, and that was ten years ago, right? But I have over the past ten years, I've continued to write. I've written a few screenplays. Tried to get them sold. Tried to get one of them produced. I'm a horror movie nut, right? I love horror mm-hmm. movies. Mm-hmm. So I've got one horror movie, one thriller one action film and they're all just sitting here ready to go. And if I had the wherewithal, I'd do it. But what I've been doing honestly is I've been pouring all my filmmaking desire into my comedy troupe. We've been shooting sketches. In fact, on my computer here right now is the thing I'm editing that we shot last weekend. So we do that. We do theatrical quality sketches. That's kind of fulfilling that desire that I have to do filmmaking. That's awesome. Yeah. So you direct, produce, voice act, write, and edit. Yeah, just everything. Yeah, man. And it's the only way you can make a living at this shit. You got <laughs> to do a whole bunch of different everything. things, man. You got to do everything. If you do just one thing, you're also going to be flipping burgers someplace, which is not bad. That's fine. Go go for it if you dig it. But I want to do this, so I do as much of it as I can. This is a bit of a, just a jump to a different topic. But personally, I'm a sci-fi fan. I love time travel and shit. Nice. Since Trunks has been a character... There was a point where he just became a character that was a time traveler. You don't only voice Trunks in the anime, right? You do video games as well, and especially the Xenoverse ones. Right. Trunks is just like the head of this time travel corporation. Like the only thing that I could think of where Trunks comes in and his character isn't just, hey, I'm a time traveler, is GT, 
which is the most reviled series in Dragon Ball history. Like, like yeah. what are your thoughts on Trunks when you started voicing him versus now where just time travel has become his character? Like, that's it. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> my favorite thing to record was Dragon Ball Super, which, Eric, I'm sorry, you're going to have to do that one next. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's better. It's way better. It is. I think it is. And the cool thing that I liked about it was that when Trunks shows up in Dragon Ball Super, he shows up like, God damn it again. Fucking fine. Let's do this shit. <laughs> you know? And it gave me as an actor something to do because here's this guy who's like, He's time traveled his whole life and now he's pissed because it won't fucking stop. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he became sort of this thing that has allowed these video games to happen, which good on them, man. Make the games, make the money. Yeah, dude, the games are awesome. But I just feel like Trunks to me in the in the Dragon Ball Z anime is just the voice of reason. Like he's the one person that is sane. Yeah. And uh, actually says what a regular person would do in that situation. And it's it sucks to see him kind of sucked into it this. It was like they didn't know what to do with him. Yeah. You know? And so he became more of a turnkey for certain storylines. Exactly. Yeah, you exactly. He, he's okay. less developed as a character and more just a plot device. But yeah, I, you know, he's cool. Um, I, I <laughs> And I did want to ask, because again, we watched... Uh, History of Trunks not too long ago today, actually. And I noticed that you voice 13-year-old Trunks as well as, you know, whatever, 17-year-old Trunks. Is it just Trunks' voice and then they screwed with it in post? Or is that you doing some no, that, space magic? Yeah, that was just me. Really? That was just me. Because it, it sounds like you but pitched up. Yeah, I, I, it was just me. And do you actually remember doing that? Because it was like oh, a yeah. long time ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that real well. I had a good time doing that. I thought it was super cool. It's like my character finally had his own thing. Yeah. Mm. You know, and I like it as a movie, but I remember them telling me to pitch my voice up. I truly don't have an answer for the fact if they messed with it in post or not. I don't think that they did. I'm pretty but sure. But you tried your best. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure. Well, because that was 20 years ago, you know? So at the time, I, I had a little more of a higher end than I do now, yeah. you know? It's just 20 years of bourbon that is <laughs> really changed the voice a little bit and age and whatnot. So I believe I did pitch the voice up. They didn't mess with it in post. But recently... I saw the trailer for the new where they're doing the history of trunks as the video game. I forget. What oh yeah. Called. The DBZ Kakarot. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. The DLC for Kakarot. Right. Yeah. Where it's the history of trunks and they had Alexis Tipton who plays young trunks do that stuff in the video game. Oh really? Yeah. So she and I are fighting now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You did Xenoverse obviously one and two. Yeah. yeah. Did you do like uh, fighter Z as well? Was my voice on there? Yeah. Then yes. I don't remember. <laughs> well, <that's> <laughs> <laughs> I have no recollection whatsoever. Okay. So how much how much have you voiced Trunks? Like at what point did it just start to bleed into each other where you're just like, I'm Trunks all the time, whatever this project is, who cares? Yeah. Uh, I would say around Super. Okay. Because it was around the beginning of Super that all the video games were stacked on top yeah, of each there's other. there's a ton. And I was doing Super, and I was doing DLCs, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going to read the lines, and hopefully y'all can direct me into the right read. It all kind of blended together right around then, I yeah, think. Yeah, it's kind of a unique thing, having the character like expanded to that many things, because there are so many video games, and each one presumably has a different writer and like a different interpretation of the events. So you're doing like the same scene over and over again, but just like, just a little different. Oh, yeah. Not even a little different sometimes. <laughs> you know, like sometimes I'll record these things and I'm like, guys, we've recorded the same scene like four times. <laughs> They're like, yeah, but that's four different iterations of the same moment, depending on the choices that the player makes. I get it. I get it. Hmm. But why don't they just pull the ship from DBZ and just they copy do. and paste it in there? On other games, they've done that. Dragon Ball is a different kind of property. You know, Dragon Ball is big and they i don't believe have ever pulled my voice from something i've recorded in an anime for the video game okay for dragon ball i know that they have done that for other things i believe they did that for tokyo ghoul 
And I heard, yeah, because somebody, that's right. Some, one of the other actors was like, did you record this game? Because I didn't. And I'm like, I didn't either. And we watched the trailer and it's like, that's our voices in a video game that we did not record. If the video game's big enough, I think it was just like a little iOS game where they just needed a couple of lines here and there. Mm -hmm. But if it's a bigger video game, they're going to go ahead and record everything from scratch, even if it's exactly the same stuff that you said in the anime. Right. Does it bother you that your voice is a uh, property that you don't control? No, no, because it's, you know, yeah, it bothers me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It bothers me. It would be nice to have that kind of control. But hey, look, you know, it's that Bob Dylan song. You got to serve somebody, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Everybody got to serve somebody. So (laughs) that's fine. My wife a long time ago said something that sticks in my head to this day. She's like, that little purple haired guy got us a house. You know, that's awesome. That's like the Michael Caine quote. Right. (laughs) I haven't seen Jaws 4 or whatever, but I do know that the house that it bought is incredible. (laughs) Yes, yes, yeah. Josh Four I saw in the theater. <laughs> Cause I'm that guy. <laughs> That's amazing. What are some of your favorite horror movies? You know, Halloween's just barely over. Oh man, I am a John Carpenter fanatic. Awesome. Mm-hmm. I am such a John Carpenter fanatic. I had a dream about him the other night. I had a dream that me and some dude were the only people who paid for this VIP experience to meet John Carpenter at a convention. And no matter where I went, he was not there. And oh I was God. I was I was very disheartened. As a convention regular, do you have people that you would pay to get their autograph? Aside from John Carpenter, I guess. Aside from John Carpenter? Not really. There are people I like to meet. I'm not an autograph collector. Like I have autographs on you can't see him right now. I have autographs on my wall. Uh-huh. Right. From actors that I've met, like William Sadler, who I'm a huge fan of. That's the thing, man. Like I Before I was doing this, I was just a kid going to actual comic cons when they were just comic vendors. Yeah. You know, back in the 80s and 90s. Back in the old days, sure. Yeah. And one time I stood, y'all know who Clive Barker is? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, right. So I stood in line to meet Clive Barker. You know, I went to the convention alone and I did a lot of things alone. I wait in there to meet Clive Barker. I get to the front of the line. He looks really tired. (laughs) <laughs> and I handed him my stuff and he opened it and he goes, what number are you? And I said, I'm number 97. And he goes, you were the first person to follow instructions because I marked the pages I wanted signed with <laughs> books. And then he was like, why don't you sit down and, and have a chat with me while I finish signing these autographs for these people? So for like the next 30, 40 minutes, I sat next to Clive Barker and he and I just chatted. While he signed autographs for these people and was like, "Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, okay, so what did you think about that story? You know, and I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. So I try to take that and apply it to my work when I'm at these cons Mm -hmm. and meeting people and knowing how important it is for them and what it means to them. You know, because some dude was cool enough to do that for me. Yeah. I'm also a fanboy, man. Like, I was in Toronto at Fan Expo and Nick Castle was there. Nick Castle co-wrote Escape from New York. He wrote and directed The Last Starfighter. He was the shape in the original Halloween, right? uh And I'm so excited to meet him. At one point, he and I are walking, like there's this huge hall to get to the green room and it's just empty and I'm walking alone and here comes Nick Castle with his assistant walking towards me and I'm like, holy shit, it's Nick Castle. Holy shit, it's Nick Castle. Holy shit, it's Nick Castle. Holy shit, that was Nick Castle. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I never said anything to him. <laughs> the shape. Oh, man. Yeah. You, I had the chance. That's incredible. I know. I know. And it was there and I lost it. And so I've tried really hard to talk to the guys who run the conventions who I'm friends with, to tell them to invite John Carpenter and me <laughs> to a con. And at that point, I won't blow it, man. I won't blow it. I will go up and I will say hi to him. But um, other than John Carpenter, I don't know. But as okay. far as like uh, horror movies, yeah, I am. I love horror movies particularly 80s horror movies Mm -hmm. one of my favorites is uh other than john carpenter stuff which is everything sure but like night of the comet i probably watch once a week (laughs) i love that movie so much a couple nights ago my i actually got my wife to watch this and she loved it psycho gorman have y'all seen psycho gorman oh my god 
I think I have actually. Dude, it's, the, it's where that those kids resurrect that being yes, from uh-huh, outer space. Yeah, totally. The movie yeah. is great. It's fantastic. It's so it's such a B movie, but it's yes. incredible. Like it's incredible. It really is. Like it I don't really know is. how they filmed it. It's the kind of movie that I would want to do if I had like you know two hundred bucks to spare. The makeup on the main guy is awesome, and oh, it's so much fun. It's a fun I, movie. Like it really is. Yeah. It really is. And I and I'm I'm such a big fan of horror movies. Half the time they don't even have to be good. And I'm just I'm just like a kid in a candy store. I love it so much. Speaking of horror and inappropriate mm. shit, do you have anything that comes across your desk like Funimation when it comes from Japan that you're just like, oh shit, how do we we can't dub this? Like it's inappropriate for American audiences, like it's not gonna work. So I haven't written for Funimation in many years or directed for them. It's just acting. You know, I get auditions where it's like questionable subject matter, which I don't have a huge problem with, Mm -hmm. but at some point you can't just voice booby shows. (laughs) And so recently I was voicing two booby shows back to back. And then like two auditions came in for two more booby shows. And I'm like, I, I don't know if my soul can handle recording four of those at the same time. You've done, you know, trunks. So why not just make your career booby shows? Yeah. How many of those actually come over from Japan? Booby shows? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't know. I mean, like how many come over? I don't really know because Funimation only gets what what they get. Exactly. Yeah. I'm assuming it's a fair amount. (laughs) Yeah. Let me answer that. It's a lot. It's a lot. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Don't ask how I know Oh my God. I should have just asked you. Yeah. Yeah, Just ask me. But it's good to know that you have a three booby show limit. Like four, that's it. It's too much. I don't want to. I don't want to be just that guy. Sure. I do other things yeah. too. But it's crazy to think that like the actors that have voiced the the most influential characters in big animes might have done a booby show or two. Oh, dude, the other th- that you don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, tell us. I will tell you. God, I can't believe I'm letting this out of the bag. Please do. So a few years ago, I was doing audiobooks, right? Okay. Never really done audiobooks before, but some big production company moved to town. I started doing audiobooks with them. I recorded some really kick ass books. There's a couple of sci fi books. There is this big book on the Holocaust that took forever that was very in depth and very enlightening to read. Mm-hmm. But I also recorded a bunch of sex books <laughs> <laughs> where there's this author. And she writes these sex books, these erotic novels, right? Mm-hmm. And it's all about women having sex with creatures. Oh right? wow! So, okay, so it's so it's you have the the werewolf series, yeah, and you have the alien series, <laughs> and you have the dragon series. How in depth does it get? Uh-huh. Ja, <laughs> as in depth as you think it does. So I'm recording a series called that we lovingly called Dragon Sex. Okay. And I read all the chapters that are from the perspective of the dragon. <laughs> and then there's this other woman who reads all the female chapters. Sure. And in the middle of one of my sessions one day, by the way, I didn't credit myself with this. And I highly suggest this to all actors out there because every actor out there does something they don't want, especially voice actors. You have something... That you do for the money, you don't want everybody to know that you did. Mm. Okay, so you have like a a pen name sort of thing. Yeah. I have an ex. So Eric Vale is not my real name. Sure. It's my stage name. So I have this secondary stage name that is actually the name of my bully from grade school. (laughs) Oh, that's so good. That's good. So I'm recording these dragon sex books, and in the middle of one of the the sessions, they pull me out of the session, and the engineer and the director are laughing so hard they're crying and they can't speak. And I'm like, what's going on? And they brought it up on the computer. And apparently the first volume of the dragon sex books had come out and there was a specialty device that if you bought the download, you also got a free (laughs) wearable vibrator for the ladies that activated on my voice. Oh, no. So when my voice was speaking, your panty vibrators went off. That's amazing. Wow. And uh, yeah. Have you checked in on the sales of like that series and the other, you know, more CD stuff that you've done? Uh, yeah, I checked in on that a few weeks ago because I was working with the woman, mm-hmm. the woman in the Dragon Sex series. Sure. She was directing me on this other project. 
And so we looked it up when we were working together and this woman is making a fucking killing. <laughs> Writing these books, she makes a killing. I swear. And they're doing really well. And apparently <laughs> there's a fan base for them and everything. So does that does that kind of thing motivate you to like do more within that fan base? Like how much does your own moral, ethical sort of compass factor into you, the jobs that you take? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Like during political season, I for whatever reason, am called in to do voices for a certain side of the political spectrum that I am not participatory with <laughs> at all. And so when I do those spots, I always take at least 20 bucks from that check and give it to the other <laughs> side. Wow. Wait, like, like the voice of like, this guy did this yeah, thing yeah, and he's okay. Yeah, yeah. So and so has done bad things in the past. <laughs> Don't let him run your state government. Uh -huh. You know, shit like that. So I would, I'm like, I need the money. I'll take the job. But some of that money that you're giving me is going to the people who are fighting you. You give a little back. That's amazing. Oh, that's yeah. so good. John, this is where you come in. Oh, cool. Buddy, I, I okay. My question is. And this is going to be followed by a monologue from John, hopefully. How weird is it that strangers know your life better than you do? Oh, what the, what the fuck that means, monologue for me? What, what do you expect? What do you mean? Like, you research so much. Yeah, yeah, but I'm suppressing it. I'm staying quiet. I, I, <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Like, this is your chance to let it out. <laughs> no, I'm good. Out of respect for you, Eric Vale, I will suppress <laughs> what? all the information that I've learned about your childhood and, and your dad being a clown, super clown, and, and everything else that I've super learned. Super clown, motherfucker. Yeah, I will just- You got it. I'll keep all that down. I'll, I'm being a normal human being for a couple minutes. Dude, the fact that you, that you brought up super clown is amazing, and that's some good research because nobody can find that shit. Your dad, he owned a company, right? And that was profitable, but he also wanted to be a clown or was- Man, I grew up poor in this really shitty town in South Texas, right? And it's funny because, like, I take my family down to Galveston to the coast for beach house summer. We'll go mm -hmm. rent a beach house down there for a week and hang out, right? Where we go rent this house is about a half mile from the place that my parents used to drive us to go crabbing and pull crab out of the oh, ocean. Oh, that's cool. I thought it was cool, too. And I was telling my mom this like a few years ago. I'm like, we're staying right down the street from where we went crabbing. Yeah. She's like, you know why we went crabbing, right? And I'm like, no. And she goes, because we didn't have enough money to feed you. <laughs> oh, shit. And well, you guys thought it was great. You got a trip and food. I loved it. I thought it was a blast. And turns out my parents were doing that because they didn't have any money. Man. And we would just pull food out of the ocean and I would eat crab for days, which as an adult turned out to be my favorite food. <laughs> yeah. So we were, we were poor and we lived in Beaumont, Texas. And there was, my dad worked for one company and he wasn't making enough money. My dad's kind of a showy personality. Everybody loves him. He's so fucking charismatic. It's sickening. <laughs> and still to this day, man, the guy, everyone just loves him. And he was always interested in things like magic and this and that. He should have gone into acting. We're there. We're making no money. Somehow, somewhere, he got the idea that he could be a clown at people's birthday parties. <laughs> so he did that. And like on the weekends, he would be booked up and he'd be super clown at people's birthday parties and juggling and doing magic tricks. Oh. And so it wasn't a lifelong dream. It was just something that he kind of fell like wanted to do instantly and... It's, it, it was a way to make money. I mean, he was good at it, I guess. Yeah, he was. He was. So why did you get into anime instead of clowning? There's just not much future in clowning, really. You don't think <laughs> really? so? <laughs> well, if you combine the thing we were talking about previously, the erotic novella with the clowning, there's kind of a lot of future. It's just very niche. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I did not do the clown sex book series. Why not? But and you could have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll need I to make have. another pseudonym, a third one, bonkers or whatever. <laughs> Absolutely. Speaking of uh, sex, what body part have you signed the most? Like, is this a thing that you actually get asked or is this just oh, a Oh, yeah. No, I get I get asked. I got to sign body parts and then people will have the signature tattooed. Holy shit. I, 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 I said that, that the same yeah, thing like yesterday. No way, right? Yeah. For real. That's crazy. I've done that. I, I would say that as far as body parts that i've signed it's usually been some like more of an appendage probably okay. arms mm. yeah that makes know. a lot of sense 
you don't have to say what it was, but is there any body part you were asked to sign that you had to say no? Um, no. You've done it. Like, whatever is asked. No, I'll do pretty much anything. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, man, put a quarter in my ass. I'm your monkey. <laughs> All right. I mean, I have not said no to a lot of things. That you should have? Or just that was a sentence. Yeah, yeah, that's just a general statement. <laughs> oh my god! Thank you from those people for being such a good sport. I guess willing to sign what the fuck ever for a quarter. Here's why. I have a great story for why. The day I ran into my wife was December fifteenth, two thousand. I had just moved from Denton to Dallas, from the college town to the big city. I was already doing all the trunks and anime stuff. I knew my wife back in college we were buddies we just hung out played street fighter 2 and oh that's you know, awesome. stuff yeah. like that yeah so we were just friends back in college and both of us a crush on each other we never asked each other out blah blah blah, blah. well i knew she was going to be at this party one night and i moved all my shit very fast into my new apartment and rushed over to this party just so i could reconnect with her in the hopes that i could go out with her it worked i ran there went to the party connected and i'm like all right we'll get together next week right that night, I went back to my apartment. I had plugged my big tube television set, and I plugged it into the wall over here. And at one point, walked through, tripped over the cord, and the tube television set fell off of the stand and hit me on the back of the head and knocked me out. So I had a concussion. I woke up, I don't know, a couple hours later, on the floor with my cat meowing at me. My cat knew I had a concussion and meowed at me in my face all night to keep me awake once I had woken back up. The next day, I had an autograph signing at Grapevine Mills Mall, this huge, big-ass mall out in Dallas. I signed autographs for four hours, took pictures and did all that shit, and then came home. I don't remember this day. <laughs> I drove myself. I don't remember getting there. I don't remember getting back. I remember one moment... Of that whole day, now uh, two moments, I remember the woman who organized it coming over to me and opening up a lipstick case and going, here's my cocaine. Oh my And God. I'm like, what? <laughs> Which was weird, right? <laughs> and then I remember this young boy staring at me like I didn't, like he didn't know what was going on. Those are the only two flashes of that day. I can't even tell you that those things were real, <laughs> but I definitely don't remember that day happening in my life, okay? This is, you know, toward the beginning of the internet. Within days, all this shit ends up on the internet about what an asshole I am. No Eric way. Eric Vale's an asshole. He treated people like shit. He, he didn't take this picture. He wouldn't do this. All this stuff. Any slight misstep I had made that day because of a concussion... I was raked across the coals for. So after that, I was like, I should probably just do everything everyone asks all the time. Man. Mm. You know? Do you have any sort of contract or, or things ongoing that you can't do? Like for fans or just in general? Or are you kind of left to your own devices? Yeah, I'm left to my own devices. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing in any contract that tells me what I can and cannot do. Okay. Because I am... <laughs> I'm not an employee. I'm a contractor. Right. You know? I guess, I, I don't know. So like with can, social media or anything, you're just like free to do whatever. Yeah. I mean, I opt to the side of caution and basically I don't post anything that basically says like, hey, I've been cast in such and such or I'm excited about working on this show. I, I just avoid all that completely mm -hmm. because I don't want to do something wrong. Sure. You know, smart say move. the wrong thing, piss somebody off. So, so you leave politics out of social media then? No. No, I don't leave politics out of social media. Are you kidding? I mean, if John did his yeah, research. I, did. I, I was browsing through your Twitter. I'm like, I know which team you're, you're yeah, I get it. Okay. John knows my team. Yeah. yeah um, it's a good team. I don't blame you. Thank you. I, I, I feel so. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, I'm a very outspoken person, but I remember I was at a con one time and somebody from Funimation decided to come sit on the panel with me and somebody mm. asked me a question from the i don't know why she did she doesn't work there anymore but she comes and sits on the panel with me and like four other people and i'm like whatever you hang out and somebody asked me a question and she goes you can't answer that and i'm like i can answer whatever i want to and she's like um no you cannot not if you work for funimation i'm like i don't fucking work for funimation my contract ends literally at the end of every session 
So right now, I'm unemployed. Fuck you. <laughs> Let me answer your question. I don't even remember what the question was. Oh, that's amazing, though. Like we were talking about, I'm a fan. I want, I want to feel that. Yeah. You know, if I'm a fan, I want to feel somebody that looks like they're breaking the rules, but they're really not. Which leads sort of into the next question, but not at all. I did want to ask you, there was a couple, there was a couple times. What grade of actor do you think you are? Do you think you're A-list, B-list, C-list, et cetera? It's below D. <laughs> I think that's where the anime voice actors probably are, like down there somewhere. <laughs> like where you get recognized at Walmart once in a blue moon. I would say that would be upper like B. Oh, C, okay. So you're you even know? below that. Yeah, Walmart okay. is a B? Okay. I mean, yeah, I would think so. I know what I'm capable of as an actor. I know I know what I bring to the table and I know what I can do. Mm -hmm. Growing up, all I wanted to do was be a movie star. I wanted to be in movies, right? And I ended up doing this, I think, because if I was in movies, I would have ended up hating it. Really? Because of all of that stuff. Because of all of the things, that, all the hoops you have to jump through and how you have to rigidly be subject to somebody else's calls with regards to producers or production companies or whatnot. And doing what I do, I'm kind of freelance. I, I don't really owe anything to anyone in any particular moment, per se. I mean, of course, I I owe people for giving me a role or, or, or the work, but I don't have to answer to them. That's the way I should say it. I don't have to answer to anybody right now about this podcast you huh. know i didn't have to check with anybody yeah to do it you're not on retainer for being trunks right 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 you know and so it's a little scary because at any point if i do or say anything that they don't like they could totally get rid of me and hire somebody else but at this point i don't know that like they would want to piss off the internet <laughs> yeah. you know it works in your favor yeah, yeah kind of but i would put myself below d Below D. Okay, that's fair. Let's call myself an E level. <laughs> I, I I like that for so many reasons. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. perfect. So I do have a question for you now that is going to delve yeah. into the world of. Uh, I'm just bringing up all the sex questions. I guess I hope that's cool. Bring it on. Of course you are. Is it weird to know that you are so so many anime fans' first like sexual awakening? Oh my god! Like Trunks appearing in Dragon Ball Z. And just the things he says and the way he looks. And, and uh, your voice, I heard a lot about it sure. in high school. And your voice. And, like, that adds so much to it. But it's it's the whole package of the, the edgy, long hair, got the sword, but also... No, but a lot of it is the sword, though. That like, that, nice, that right? was a huge chunk. Well, because that's not a phallic symbol. <laughs> no, and they're definitely not shooting huge, thick beams. Right, not yeah, at all. At None all. of that's yeah. happening. Big, sweaty beefcakes just pounding on each other. But is it weird? <laughs> is it weird to see these people come through? And, and you know, you know in the back of their eye. I know. Some, so many people have even said it to me, you know? And to me, it's... I mean, I guess I kind of have gotten used to it over time. Mm. There are some people who are weird about it. I had one young woman, and I say young woman, I mean girl. Mm -hmm. Like she was probably 14. By the way, 14-year-old girls are insane. Yeah. <laughs> they are. Insane. And as a father of a 15-year-old girl, I can tell you, 14-year-old girls are insane. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> Oh, I thought she heard me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that happens at these cons, like there's a lot of a lot of sexual awakening going on with a lot of roles that I've played, mm -hmm. right? And for whatever reason, my characters, a lot of my characters really speak to what I call my favorite fan base, which is these 14-year-old girls who have a question mark over their sexuality, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. My character from... My hero really draws them in. My characters from uh, Hetalia also really draw them in. And I say this to them when they come through. I mean, because to me, they're just, they're kids. These I'm a dad, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, look, I know what you're going through. It sucks. Whatever you feel you are, be that. I hope everything goes well for you. But this one girl at a con one time that I didn't have great security at, I'm signing autographs where people are coming up this way and she goes around me, comes over here and then licks my face oh, what? and ran away. Oh. And I, and it was so fast. I'm like, it's a drive by licking. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. It was just 
and she's like, ah, and ran off. And I'm like, oh, God. like I still to this day haven't showered enough to get that. Yeah, off you of can me. still feel it. Mm. It's oh, oh man, God. nothing prepares you for that. No, 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 no. You can't be prepared for something <laughs> like that. So, and there are people who do that. Like there have been times where it's like I'll take a picture with somebody and they'll grab my ass and i'm like the hell makes you think that's okay yeah gross leave my ass alone my ass is disgusting (laughs) i shot i shot a video short the other day where i had to have my bare ass on camera i swear to god it looks like a piece of tofu that somebody just cut right down the center what do you mean you had to have your bare ass on camera (laughs) well it was the funniest way to end ah okay okay (laughs) so See, that's that's amazing to me that you can, I don't even want to say live your own life, but you can literally do whatever you want and still have whatever you want, be in the public eye and not have that affect what you've done and what you continue to do. It's it's not bad. Yeah, yeah I just hope that one day I can show my bare ass to the world and, and not yeah. have my employer care at all. You don't want to, trust <laughs> me. As I, I thought I was like, I was like, I'm in, I'm doing it, I'm all over. It was at a con in Dallas in July, where my comedy troupe performed and we performed this sketch, I'm basically wearing assless chaps. Okay. Right? Yeah. And the punchline at the end of the joke is I turn around like this and the audience sees my ass. Once we got to that moment, I'm like, oh, this is a terrible idea. What have I done? <laughs> and everyone, everyone in the audience was like, that was horrific. <laughs> and then we shot it. And then when I'm sitting here editing my big fat ass, I was like, oh, God, why did I show anyone that? Why is my <laughs> wife still married to me? So what I'm getting from this is that your your life is more than just trunks. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> is there any other questions that you guys want to ask? Because I've got shit. Um, no, I mean, we we had no plan for this. It was basically like, hey, let's fucking hang out with Eric Vale. So I don't know. Whatever we decide to talk about, <laughs> it, it'll come up, I guess. I'm just here so I won't be fined. I'm just enjoying being here. <laughs> yeah, same. Did you ever like at a con, you know, you're sitting there signing autographs. You look across the room. You see other celebrities. Is there anybody that you're like, hey, I didn't think that I was on the same level as you. Yeah. Who have you seen that you were impressed by, I guess? Like I had mentioned earlier, Will- William Sadler. Yeah. Uh-huh. I love William Sadler. <laughs> I have forever, right? Since Die Hard 2, right? Uh-huh. I was across the aisle from him at one convention and the whole time i'm sitting there signing and i've a lot of people it was really nice and i'm signing i'm signing i'm like fucking william sadler's (laughs) right there right there and i'm gonna go talk to him why are all of you getting my autograph no like do you not and i've said that to people before like do you know who that is why are you here so yeah i went across and talked to him and he was like oh you're the guy over there with the really long line. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Because actors are weirdly competitive. About the the length of their lines and stuff. Y- yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he was he was fine. He was super nice. Gave me an autograph. Took a picture with him. But he was he was kind of like, why are you coming to talk to me? <laughs> you know. And it's like it, there's no there's no accounting for who people are fans yeah. of. Yeah. You know. But yeah, off, oh God, it's like freaking, okay, two weeks, three weeks ago, I was at a convention with Michael Bean. Okay. Hicks from Alien. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. Terminator, The Abyss. Of course, God damn, yeah. The Abyss, dude. He was on set during one of the most problematic film shoots in history. And I love that movie. I love his stuff. And so, you know, we sort of hung out in the green room a little bit and chatted and whatnot. And then... My buddy was his assistant because we had the same age. We have the same booking agent. And so I went Sunday morning. I walked over there to my buddy and I just let him know I'm here. I'm like, hey, I'm here. How's it going? And he's like, you got to come give me a hug. Like he's this big dude. He's hilarious. And I'm like, all right, fine. I come over and I give him a hug and I stand up and Michael Bean is right there. And he goes, so I don't get a hug. (laughs) And I'm like, Sure, I will hug you, Michael Bean. And I go there and I give him a hug. That's amazing. And I walk off and I immediately text my best friend. I'm like, holy fucking shit, man. You are not going to believe what just happened. (laughs) This buddy of mine is the guy who I saw aliens with in the theater when we were kids. And we watched The Terminator a thousand times, you know? Do your friends continue to give you shit even though you're fucking trunks in Dragon Ball? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Oh, yeah. 
I don't have a whole lot of friends that I grew up with. I, I didn't like where I grew up. I didn't hang out with a lot of cool people. Like that dude, David, he's the only person I really talked to from my youth. I have other friends that I've made as I've gotten older that have nothing to do with, with my business. And every one of them gives me a pretty hefty amount of shit. <laughs> Good. Perfect. Good. It keeps your ego in check, right? Absolutely. That's part of the reason I stayed in Texas, man. I didn't want to go out to LA and blow the head up. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I can stay here around normal people, which has not proved to be what I thought it was over the past five years. <laughs> Things got weird. <laughs> In Texas, weirder. Yeah, than I weirder. Expect. Would you have been better off to move to LA? Or are you happy with your decision to stay where you have been? So, about five years ago, I was hanging out with my buddy Todd Habercorn, who's another voice actor, real well known, super guy. Mm-hmm. He's from here also. He was telling me about his one bedroom apartment in Los Angeles <laughs> where he has to pay for parking. That's what I was going to ask. And this next. guy. This guy makes a lot more money than I do, <laughs> right? Because he can afford that one bedroom apartment in Los Angeles plus the parking uh-huh. spot. My mortgage in Texas is less than half of his rent Ooh, on his God. one bedroom Jeez. apartment. And I have a five bedroom house with a front yard and a backyard. How difficult was it to make a home in Texas when you were working for Funimation at the beginning? Remote work wasn't the big thing back then. What did it take to get you to dictate your own life, basically? Getting married helped, (laughs) you know? Really? Like, even in the Um, eyes of the the companies that you were working for? I don't know, man. I'm pretty good with the word no. And that's something that actors have a hard time with. Mm -hmm. Too many actors are too busy thanking people for the roles that they've earned. Like, you did the work. You've earned something have the confidence that you're bringing something to the table that matters to these people. Right. And so I have always been big with saying no. Like if I don't want to do something, I say no, I would make sure that I'd separated my work life and my home life. Like when people would say, Hey, do you want to do this out of town thing? No, I don't. I want to stay at home with my family that weekend. Did I not make money that weekend? Sure. But it was way more important, whatever I was doing with my family. Yeah. You know, and my wife grounds me a lot and always has. She's a very earthy person, very brass tacks. It was chaotic for sure, but I was always, always had somebody to pull me back from the edge. So get married. That's the advice. If you want to make a home, (laughs) just just get married. Just get married. Yeah. Something about my cool wife. Yeah. She's pretty cool. We've only gotten that like five or six times throughout hanging out is how cool your wife is. So it's fantastic that it's working out that well. (laughs) <laughs> okay i'm gonna ask you a question that uh basically john told me not to but i'm so curious oh i can't wait oh i love it we okay. met you once mm-hmm. john and i talked to you it was pretty cool you really liked us and were really impressed by us we took off you said uh you know come back with eric we came back with eric and you weren't there whatever yeah. It's your life. Because fuck you guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. And um, and you were gone. But your wife had said to us when we went up there to get your, you know, we stood in line. She said, hey, I want chocolates. Like that was the first thing that she said to us. We didn't know Always. that she was your wife. And when we came back with Eric, you were gone, obviously, because fuck you. And <laughs> we left, actually, a little baggy of chocolates that we had because we were giving out candy at our booth at Fanex. Yep. And we a little bit of note. Did that creep you out? No. Like, was that a step too far? No, no, no. Because my wife, she's like, oh, I told them to bring me chocolates and they brought exactly, me chocolates. Exactly, yeah. Was exactly what she said. She was super excited. Okay, so that that helped instead of hurt. Because we were... Uh, oh, yeah. We were asking the question pretty much all night mm-hmm. after we that, whether sure. we had made the right... right oh, question. no, no, no. Uh, look, the woman wanted something. You guys delivered. That's better than I do. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Do you happen to know Jonathan Frakes? This is an absolute fucking shot in the in the dark. I have met him, but I don't know him. Oh, Shit. okay. Did you meet him in the fact like, hey, sign this, you know, piece of furniture? No, I, I met own, him in Australia at a convention. Oh, cool. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was at this weird convention in Australia with, he was there, Jason Momoa, before Jason Momoa was... Yeah, when he was Jason just on Momoa. Stargate. Yeah, exactly. He had done Stargate, Game of Thrones, and the Conan movie. Okay, oh, yeah. yeah. Right, right. I'll tell you, cool thing about... Ja- like, first off, Jason's 
cool as hell, super nice guy. He's just like a really normal dude. I was going to talk about Patrick Stewart. It all ties together in so many people, time and yeah, everything. And to so, <laughs> but so Jason was super cool, very nice guy, down to earth. Like one time he was on the phone talking to his wife about his kid's biological dad, right? Mm-hmm. And he's just having a normal dad conversation. He's just being dad. And I remember sitting there with him. I put together, I'm like, that's Lenny Kravitz he's talking about. <laughs> Lenny Kravitz <laughs> is... Oh. He's stepdad to Lenny Kravitz's kid. That's weird as hell. Whoa. Fucking weird. That's so weird. It kind of broke my brain in that moment. Because because he and I were chatting about something, and then he took the call, and he hung up, and he's like, yeah, so we, we were talking about blah, 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 blah. And I was like, <laughs> you know, like, whoa, that's weird. And then it was like right after that, I went to do photo ops, and it was just me, Chris Sabat, and, and Patrick Stewart backstage alone. And I'm like, I'm going to go talk to Patrick Stewart. And Sabbath's like, sure. So I went up and talked to Patrick Stewart. Patrick Stewart, also just the nicest fella. And he kept saying, he's like, I know you. And I'm like, oh, we've not met before. And we would talk about something. And then he'd stop and he'd go, no, but you're an actor, right? And I'm like, well, yeah, but voiceover and not a lot on camera and nothing you'd seen me before. And he goes, but I, I think I know you. And I'm like, I, you don't. <laughs> we've never met. And it started, I realized very quickly, he's just like everyone's granddad. Please tell mm. me that Patrick Stewart watches Dragon Ball Z. No. Oh, no. Mm. But we did talk about American Dad. So that uh, was fair cool. enough. That's good. And I told him, I'm a voice actor and stuff. And he's like, are you, sh- <laughs> are you sure you don't do on-camera work? <laughs> and I'm like, I do on-camera work, but it's nothing you would have seen. I promise you. And then like six months later, we're at another convention. I'm in the green room and... Patrick Stewart walks in and he's like, oh, Eric, hi. I'm like, wow. Whoa, that's cool. He just remembered and He's you? like, I've got to go to the bathroom. He goes to the bathroom, comes back, sits down and he goes, I'm still trying to remember <laughs> where I know you from. And I'm like, dude, you don't, you don't know me. I, I, except for this. This is cool. Can it just be this. All right. But Eric Vale, fuck Patrick Stewart. Do you know Jonathan Frakes? <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> I met him that weekend. And all I did was I, I I stood next to him and I shook his hand and we both had we did this Jonathan Frakes and I did this so I was like, oh hey he's like hey I'm 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 Jonathan I'm, I'm Eric nice to meet you how's going super tall <laughs> and that's it is he, okay like, six, fair enough six, nine or something dude he's super tall is he really he's real he's taller I'm five eleven he's definitely taller than me Shit. okay fair enough yeah because like cards on the table Eric hates Dragon Ball Z whatever we did an April Fool's episode where we did a Jonathan Frakes uh, love fest where we just talked about his work and all that stuff. Yeah. We're trying to get him on the show. So if you could just like, you know, send him a DM or something, we really, <laughs> yeah, sure. It. I'll, I'll let him, yeah. I'll let him know. I swear <laughs> to I, I would not be surprised if I end up at a convention with him. It, and it when, seems when I do. Yeah, for sure. I will pimp it. Thank you very much. We appreciate Absolutely. that. I will pimp it hard. My dogs are pissed at me. <laughs> oh my god. You're not kidding. As if on cue. The fucking Cujo just like shines from the hallway. That dog is the sweetest dog I've ever had. Oh. She eats everything that's not nailed down. We got her everything we have over here is a rescue. We rescued her from a dog meat farm in South Korea. Whoa, oh, that's awesome. Wow. Real? What's her name? Yeah, for real. Her name is Frida. They named her over there Captain Freedom. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. The guy, the guy, were, the guy is an army dude, a uh, U.S. Army guy, and he's he now lives in South Korea. And his job is actually he relocates animals from that side of the world back to America and over to that side of the Ooh. world. So, for usually for military families, right? Wow. But in his spare time, he rescues these dogs from these dog meat farms that are closing. Thank God. So that's where we got her from, and she's the sweetest freaking thing in the world and the other dog is insane <laughs> absolutely insane. balance it out though. do you hate interviews that you've been in yeah can you watch them can you watch your own self no is it always fine or is there sometimes where it's like oh god i gotta get out of here it's always that <laughs> it's always oh god make it end make it end make it end and and this is why i wanted to do this because i knew that doing this with you guys was going to be the opposite of every That's, one of those other interviews. Put that in the trailer. That's just it. <laughs> <laughs> At no point, and I will tell you this, not one time, and it's probably because of your researcher, John, 
but not one fucking time as you guys have has not one fucking time as you guys <laughs> asked me. Not one time have you guys asked me how I got into voice acting. Yeah, I don't care. It's because we don't give a shit. Like, yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. See? I love that. Like when people when I meet people and they're like, I don't fucking know what anime is. I'm like, great, let's get a drink. For sure. <laughs> you know? That's perfect. We don't know any of the other roles that you've been in. Yeah, for sure. Oh, great. One fucking thing. And that's it. That's perfect. But finally, as we've gotten to this point at the interview, Eric Bale, can you get me into voice acting? Please. <laughs> I just want a job. Are you kidding me? I really um, can. <laughs> I really can. I can I can crack open all those doors. <laughs> Sprinkle some powder. Fantastic. Are you kidding, man? These people are like, they're like, hey, I'd I'd like to do what you do. I'd really like to get into voice acting and, yeah. and maybe you could teach me and stuff. I'm like, why the fuck? Would I put more people in the goddamn pool? <laughs> yeah, they're competition. That's true. You want me to train you to be better than me? Fuck you. Do it on your own. <laughs> yeah. and that's, that's hilarious because you, you sent somebody with talent and you try to deter them away from <laughs> yeah. the actual job. Dude, none of them have talent. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, some of them do. Look, I, I, I will look com to be completely honest. There have been. A handful, and I mean literally less than five people who over the years have come to me and said, like at a convention and said, like, I want to get into voice acting. How do I do it? Mm -hmm. But these are the people who come to me and have said things like, like this young woman who actually now goes to school about a mile from my house at UTD. I met her at a convention in West Texas, and she was like, look, I just auditioned for Juilliard. I didn't get in. Ooh. I'm in a theater program here. I'm looking to springboard to a different theater program so I could get my foundation. I'd like to do voice acting, but I just want to be an actor and I need somebody to point me in the right direction. Amen. Like, I will help you. I will help you if that's what you want. But most people don't want that. When they ask that question, most people are just because it's at a convention. People think that because I'm sitting on the other side of this table, that that's the the place to be yeah mm -hmm. you know they just want to be on the other side of the table they don't want to do the work that got me there oh absolutely yeah. and it you seems know. like that woman like knew what she was talking about right yeah yeah she does and i'm disappointed because i actually missed the play that she was in she invited us to recently but i couldn't go oh. but she's she's seems to be pretty talented seems to know what she wants oh that's awesome but uh yeah so i i was i was happy to do this with you guys because i knew that it wouldn't be the same set of questions the other day i did a press day for um one piece and mm. you know you're just doing interview after interview as yeah. many as you can fit in and it was all exactly the same a every interview had like the same five questions i'm i'm happy to hear that we're doing different questions also if i could add a question in who the fuck are you in one piece uh sanji okay i know Does it doesn't ring a bell much. that's <laughs> well you probably know this but like one piece especially I know enough about the anime to know that it is hundreds of episodes long and it's not even done yet. Yeah. Dragon Ball Z, like the one um, good thing about it, I don't know why I said that because <laughs> is it ends? The one good thing. Uh, John and I actually like the good the the show. Eric hates it. But the, it, it's it has a beginning, <laughs> middle, and end, right? Like it has a finish it does. point. And One Piece isn't even close. And it's twice the size, if not more, of Dragon Ball Z. So it's yeah hard to get into like it's it's very difficult yeah. to recommend it's very difficult to like jump into as a viewer because it's just i so get that that was the that was all the questions we had the other day there every single person asked that same question what do you say to somebody who <laughs> you wanna get them in you want to get them into one yeah. piece but it's such a long show and it's like i can't answer the question the way that i want to answer the question where it's like i don't know let people like what they want to like yeah for sure i you mean know? if they're gonna watch it they're gonna watch it and right. the longer it goes on, the better it is for you, right? Because the, the chances that your character will come. Oh yeah, like I mean, I look that show to me is the kind of show that I would watch because it's absolute fucking bonkers <laughs> insane. Like it is so fucking weird, top to bottom, and I totally can get on board with something like yeah. that. Yeah, but I don't know. It just seems such a weird question. What do you say to somebody who feels intimidated by the length of? this show and if they're trying to get into it i'm like i don't really know how to answer yeah that. how often do you do you actually have to recommend animated people like it doesn't seem like that happens in your everyday life no, at I, all i don't that's not my job my job is just <laughs> do the yeah. voice, although man. i am curious so wadi hates dragon ball z do you think that he would hate one piece more or my hero academia oh, yeah. or other oh yeah 
Oh yeah, if you hate Dragon Ball Z, buddy, don't even go into. <laughs> yeah, you no, oh, you will hate those other shows. I, I think this is a great time, Eric. What does specifically do you hate about Dragon Ball Z? Like, spell it out for us. So my my biggest beef with it is the yelling. Honestly, <laughs> the amount of fluff there is drawing this out into this conversation that is ridiculous and would never exist in in any reality. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and, it, and it, it, it grinds me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Eric Vale, just so you know, kind of the context, I once sent our Eric the clip of Goku going to Super Saiyan 3. It's the one that he blew his vocal cords out on, and you can hear it in the recording. Who was this? Goku? Yeah, yeah. Right, John? Yeah, Shemmel. Shemmel blew out his cords, apparently. Oh, okay. All right. During the, the transformation of Super Saiyan 3. Yeah. Eric wouldn't even watch it. Okay. That's kind of the point. Is <laughs> yeah. like I, I copy and paste okay. that into our little conversation. He's like, no. From the thumbnail, like I can see this is something I don't want to watch. Like any kind of hint of of exasperation or, or um the yelling, the screaming, the trumping reality. I'll yeah. say is not he's not interested it's in, not and like yeah. it it does bother me and John too. But it's it, it's been surprising how Dragon Ball Z is fine. Like yeah. for the most part, it doesn't actually go into that realm except for like a couple peaks per season. Yeah, yeah. So it's very watchable. That's true. Anyway, it's weird. It, I, it's weird to look at it. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, no, you go ahead. Yeah, it, yeah sometimes John. it's shitty. That's all I had to say. Sometimes <laughs> it's shitty. That was it, dude. So, yeah, yeah, sometimes everything is shitty. Do you think? You know? Do you? Yeah, okay, true. you're yeah. close friends with Christopher Sabat, and do you guys ever reminisce about like shit that sucked to record? Not really. People, <laughs> people we work with. Oh, okay. How does that, like, nah. where does it deviate from, <laughs> hey, you guys are the voice actors, you've done this for a long time, we're just going to put uh. you in a booth and do your own thing. Like, w- w- how does it get annoying? It's like any other job. You work with people who are like, you're, you're like, why does Janet always smell like a perm? You know, <laughs> things like that. It's like, why okay. does she smell like that? She doesn't always get a perm, does she? Yeah, it's like Not water cooler every talk. Day. Like actually just in yeah. the office. I was directing this one actress. And so this is the kind of stuff we reminisce about. Like if we're sitting at dinner and we've had a couple of drinks, we're really going down the road. It's never about the shows. We love the work. But we would always talk shit about like the people who are our friends and coworkers and stuff like that. And luckily, there's been enough drama in the anime world over the past couple of years that there's never a lack of things to talk about. <laughs> Here's a story. One time I was directing. This actress was in the booth on a Thursday. And then on Friday, she comes back into the booth first thing in the morning. She's wearing exactly the same thing she left (laughs) in the day before. She looks like she's been hit by a truck. She reeks of booze. Mm. I found out later she had taken some mushrooms and other stuff and got shit-faced and stayed up all night. Yeah, that's good detective work. Right? Right. She goes into the booth and she grabs a bottle of Lysol and starts spraying it like deodorant. Oh, oh. All right. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? So shit like that. That's what we talk about. Those people. That, oh, that makes so much more right. sense. So like the work actually, you know, voicing the episodes and stuff that just kind of slides right by you. It's that's just work. Yeah. Yeah. OK. That makes sense. That's just that's just getting things done. I mean, every. Every once in a while, there'll be something that popped up while we were working. And and I mean, every once in a while. The only thing I can think of right now is that hold your fire. That man isn't black line. Wait, huh? Which one? No, I'm sorry. From, what? <laughs> from Super? Okay, guys. John okay. would know this better than John, I do because I haven't seen Super yet. John. That went over my head. I didn't even think about it at the time. That what? actually in, got in Super? In Dragon Ball Super... There's, you know, the the big arc for Trunks when he shows back up is he's fighting Goku Black. That's right. That's Who right. everyone calls Black, Black. not mm-hmm. Goku <laughs> Black, just Black. So it was scripted. I'm in the booth and I'm working with this other engineer, director and engineer. He was doing both, this guy. I read everything cold, right? So I see the line and the first time I'm reading the line is as it's falling out of my mouth, Mm -hmm. right? And that's just something I've been trained to do over time. Trunks, Goku, and Vegeta, I think, all go back to the future where Black has destroyed everything. 
and these dudes jump up with their guns and aim them at Goku, and they're like, shoot him! And I, my character jumps out and goes, hold your fire. This man isn't black. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that makes way more sense. So that line has become, you know, kind of <laughs> meme-ish shit. Yeah. and iconic. My favorite thing about it is that the black dudes will come through my line and have me write it on their oh, pop or their good. thing because sure. they think it's hilarious. And I always tell them, I'm like, if you want to see something funny, let's talk about this loud in front of the white guys. Because <laughs> all the white guys start, they, they do this. They're like, oh, oh, God. Whoa, what's that over there? You know, it's really funny. It's really Holy funny. Holy shit. So how does that stuff like pass by? Because it comes from Japan. But Americans interpret everything, translate everything, write the script, the lines are, are created. How is that not sensed as problematic before you cold read it? I guess it got through because it is true. Like it's a one-to-one -one translation. Right. It's true. Hold your fire. This man isn't that character that you think he is. His name happens to be Black, <laughs> but you can't say all of that. <laughs> And you're forced into fitting it into the animation that already exists. Right. So it made sense to the writer who wrote it. It made sense to the head writer who edited it. And it got into the studio and we recorded it that way. And at the time, it was it was before the big 2020 Black Lives Matter protests yeah. were happening. So it was a few years before that. When we also had Black Lives Matter protests happening for the same damn reason, but they were they were kind of decreasing, right? Mm -hmm. And that's when we recorded this. And my hope was because I don't get to do anything that I feel is important socially. Mostly what I do is just telling a story. Right. So here was this moment where I was like, you know, this is something that a is hilarious. <laughs> it's just hilarious. But B, and more importantly, is that it still, people are still having me write this. They're still talking about this. So it's still shining a light on this thing that I felt was important, socially speaking. Mm. I don't know what that experience is like. I'm just some white guy. But I know what it's like talking to my friends and the shit that they've had to deal with. So they all think that it's both funny and important. Yeah. And if you can do something that's funny and important, I fucking do well, it. Well, that's... That that's really cool to hear because it is a joke, but it sheds light on something so much greater. Yeah, it resonates. Okay, I gotta ask. After Dragon Ball Z, we're gonna talk about all the episodes and stuff. We don't know what to do after. We gotta give something to our fan base. We're thinking about jumping into Dragon Ball GT. How much do you remember about that experience, and what's wh like? What's your opinion of the the series as a whole? Because you were in like. Almost every single episode. Yeah, I was writing it too. At oh the my time. God. Um, okay. Nice. Okay. Yeah. That's even better. I will say that don't hate me. I kind of liked that show. Really? Yeah. I mean, look, Trunks' character design was stupid. Yes. Nobody should wear those fucking shorts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No one. And they changed his character away from the cool badass that he was mm -hmm. and just turned him into a nerdy scientist. If you can forget Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball GT is actually kind of a fun adventure. It's like it's this one-off adventure that's just, they're just running around doing all this stuff. They go to these crazy planets, run into these crazy aliens, and all this stuff happens. And Trunks isn't the badass warrior. He's just some nerdy scientist. So it's kind of like a different show. It's kind mm. of like it doesn't exist in the Dragon Ball universe. Mm. It's actually a lot more in tone with the original Dragon Ball than Z. Problem is, is that Dragon Ball Z is one of the most popular television shows in the history of Earth. So yeah. you're making a sequel to that. You know, it's kind of like The Phantom Menace. Uh, I love that you, you know? brought that up. I, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing you can do. It's going to suck because there's no way it's going to live up to those expectations. It can't. It can't. Yeah. Is the like if if no Star Wars ever existed and the Phantom Menace came out, it would have fucking blown people's minds. <laughs> it would have killed. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's not the way things worked. So you're saying GT is like the Phantom Menace, but we should take it as if the original Star Wars never came out then. <laughs> I mean, if you want, you could do that, but... I can try and suspend the disbelief. <laughs> I'll do my best. 
Yeah, do your best because I don't know that you can. <laughs> Me neither. But also, do you hate <laughs> the voice actor for Kid Trunks because it's taken so much work away from you in Dragon Ball Super? Yeah, I got a problem with yeah. her. <laughs> Alexis fucking tip. <laughs> I love Alexis. I, no, I, I I adore her. She's great. Laura Bailey played uh, Young Trunks first, but Laura Bailey is now neck deep in. That's actually uh, insane that Laura Bailey did. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But so she's doing all. She's got you know all of her stuff going on right now, which is huge. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. yeah great she's amazing. Her. Alexis, I adore. Alexis and I are buddies. Get along great. She is amused by me. We had a very interesting meeting the first time. She and I, like I said, we never worked together. So when you get to a convention with somebody, it's the first time you've met them, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so she and I were at a convention in Columbus, Ohio. It was a weird con. It was at a convention center attached to a hotel. I've been to the con multiple times. And they put us signing autographs in a hallway. (laughs) So we're we're in a hallway. And I literally come to the autograph table and there's Alexis and she's like, hi, Eric Vale. It's nice to meet you. I'm like, oh, I've never met you before either. It's nice to meet you. And we get along immediately. We sit down, we're signing autographs. And it's when Hitalia is really big and Hitalia has this, uh, I play America in that show and America, the character is very big and boisterous, just like the country is and obnoxious. And so I'm doing that voice a lot, right? We're getting through this autograph line. It's going about an hour and about 10 minutes, 10 minutes before we're finished. The double doors across the hallway open and this dude in a yellow polo shirt comes over to me, walks across the hall, slams his hand down on the table and he looks at me and he goes, listen, I don't know what you think you're doing. Maybe you think you're being cute or funny out here, but some of us are actually trying to get some work done. And I'm like, what? Like, how would I, what are you talking about? And he's like, we're in there having an actual meeting about things that actually matter. And and here you are just out here guffing it up and, and horking around and thinking that you're super funny and great. Good for you. But maybe if you could just shut up for a little while so that we can get some work done. And I'm like completely taken aback. And he turns around and goes back through the double doors. Look, if y'all have learned anything about me by now, you know, like, that's my big thing. Like, I'm not, I don't take bullshit off of people. Yeah. And that was just bullshit. I'm like, what is the fucking going? Okay. So there's like 10 people left. And I signed 10 autographs mm-hmm. real fast. And Alexis, who I've never met before, goes, mm. what are you doing? And I put the autograph and I stand up and I go, I'm going through those fucking doors and I'm going to tell this piece of shit what's what. And she's like, no, you're not. They go, yeah, I am. And I go to the double doors and I throw them open like the opening scene of The Prisoner. So I throw the doors open and there's 300 people in this room. <laughs> and there's a guy giving a PowerPoint presentation. And I'm like, and I look around the room and I see that fucking yellow shirt guy. And I go, <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> and I walk into the room and I go, excuse me. This motherfucker right here (laughs) and the CEO of the company pushes me into the hallway (laughs) and he's like, he's like, what is going on? And I'm like, I'd like to ask you the same fucking question. And we just have this huge argument. And the whole time, poor Alexis Tipton is doing this (laughs) just like right next to me. And I'm like, and I told this guy, I'm like, look, I leave my family for the weekend. I'm out here working. I'm not having a good time or yucking it up or whatever ass hat in there told me I was doing, but I'm here working just like you're here working. And you tell that fucking guy to stay out of my path this weekend. That'll be beneficial for him. And the CEO is like, you got it. I apologize. I'm so sorry. This won't happen for the rest of the weekend. Everywhere I went was yellow shirt guy <laughs> everywhere what? in the bar at the restaurant across the street, walking down the hallway, we kept crossing paths, and every time <laughs> he's like super scared that something was going to Who happen. The hell so was that's yellow shirt guy. Nobody. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. All right. Fair Just enough. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> he wasn't. No, I mean, look, I get it, man. They had a job to do. I had a job to do. You know, and we were all doing it. And nobody knew there was going to be people signing autographs and screaming in the fucking yeah. hallway when they were having their 300 person PowerPoint presentation <laughs> over marketing. I don't know. But 
I always thought it was a funny way to meet somebody. Oh, yeah. It's pretty good. It's uh, very unique. Let's say that. So that circles back to your original question. Like, what do we talk about? We talk about shit like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. These actors. That makes sense. Know? Why wouldn't you? That's that's such a collection of unique experiences. I don't know anybody else who would break into a hall of 300 people and just call one yellow shirt guy out. Absolutely crazy. I mean, granted, I'm not. I'm not that hot under the collar anymore. That was a good 10. <laughs> Changed a lot since then. Yeah, these days, if that guy came out and yelled at me now, I'd be like, okay. <laughs> yeah, whatever. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. I'm going to go get a drink after this, you know? Yeah. You get tired as you get old. I get that. I'm only 30, and I'm getting that. It's a nightmare. Dude, 30 is hard. Do all your bones hurt? All yes. your bones yes. That's hurt? happening right now. The bones. That's what I'm telling you, man. They're just going away. Finally, somebody understands. Dude, the second I... T like, my birthday, from 29 into 30, I woke up on my 30th birthday, and I'm like, what the fuck? Does everything hurt? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. It's like your body knows. Like, look, you're past your prime. I, I don't give a shit anymore. I'm not yeah, going to give you right? any of that. Endorphins, you don't need that. It's way better when you're 40. Like, when I turned oh. 40, I felt I felt fine. That's, that's huh. good to know. It gets better. Yeah. 30 was just rough, man. I'll tell you a, a little secret. Start taking glucosamine now. What the fuck is glucosamine? Yeah. Glucosamine chondroitin? That's it, man. That's John, it. how do you know what that is? What is happening? Because I'm an old man. Because I had to get <laughs> to my dog. Because my dog had joint problems and he couldn't move around. And so we gave him It's glucosamine. dog like, medicine? No, it's just oh, medicine. Everyone, everyone takes it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's basically like lube for your joint. Yeah. Ah, okay. I mm. see. I see. That's it. And if you take it, everything hurts less. Okay. Because it's joint lube. It's joint lube. I'm going to start doing yeah. that. I'll send you progress pics. It's just going to be of my elbow and you're not going to be able to tell, but one will say better at the bottom. That's good. That's, I appreciate we'll that. We'll see. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> Before you go, I did, I did want to get a plug. You do charity work for... Mostly what I do, the charity stuff. I do a lot of different stuff like that, but you're probably thinking about acing autism. That's the one. Yep. Yeah, yeah, on your website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my daughter's tennis stuff. Yeah. Oh, it's for tennis. That's so smart. I like that. Yeah. Acing autism. Whatever. Yeah, man. Usually in April for, for autism awareness. Well, they changed that recently. It's not it's no longer autism awareness. It's something different. I forget what it is right now, but they're changing that and that's fine. But usually I do a fundraiser in April and then give all the money to Acing Autism, which is a charitable organization that teaches tennis to children and adults with autism, then sends them to the Special Olympics. So, oh man, that's, that's awesome. awesome. In fact, I was there just this morning. My daughter is not part of the Special Olympics group. She she's she does it more for enjoyment and socialization. So on the right side of the courts are all the kids who are doing it for that. On the left side of the courts are all the kids who are training to go to the Special Olympics for tennis. And uh it's really kick ass. Great group of people. They're expanding around the country all the time. Yeah, I oftentimes bring their materials to conventions and hand out bracelets and little brochures and stuff when I can for that kind of thing. I've grown up around special needs people, so it felt kind of like a natural thing in my life to become a special needs parent. Mm -hmm. My uh, cousin on my mom's side, the only cousin I have on either side of my family older than me, by like two weeks, has Down syndrome. So he and I were, we were raised like brothers. And he lives now in a cool facility out in Louisiana. That's the other thing. The other thing that a lot of people don't talk about is how, uh, for whatever reason, people with autism or autism spectrum issues are really drawn into anime. So oftentimes, a lot of the people we get to meet at these conventions are all people who are on the spectrum in one way or another. Now, luckily, I live with this at home every single day. So it's, I feel easier for me to identify with these people when they come through my line. And it's, it's a lot of fun. You have all these parents who don't understand their children and then they get to the front of my line and then I'll be like, no, I totally understand what you're going through. <laughs> and I can talk to their kids in a way that nobody else ever has. And I can identify with them in ways that not a lot of other people can. And it's pretty cool. I yeah. got to say, you know, that's cool. Using your fame for something actually, you know, productive for society. I try to because I spend a lot of time not doing that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> totally selfish and whatever. Decades, yeah. decades being a selfish <laughs> fucking actor, asshole. Yeah. But at the end, you're giving it back. So it's fine. Uh, it's, it's OK. It, it all comes back around eventually. Do you want to do more like film stuff 
Or are you solidly in anime now, forever? No, man. I want to do more film stuff. In fact, my son, I'm producing his short film. We're going to shoot here in about a month. We shot three of my comedy sketches last week, or my comedy troops sketches last week, not all mine. And we're going to shoot three or four more next month. But I, you know, I'm always writing and I'm working on a feature screenplay right now that I really like. Above all other things, I want to make a horror movie. I wrote a horror movie a few years ago that I want to really, really badly want to make. And it's called The Vicious. And it's about uh, Chupacabras. You know Chupacabras? Yeah, of course. (laughs) So the story is about this young Border Patrol agent in Texas. These people are killed by Chupacabras on the border, including his girlfriend. And he, while he's trying to solve her murder or her death, he uncovers a conspiracy where somebody is breeding the chupacabras oh. in order to keep people out of America. <laughs> oh my God. That's, that's amazing. That's that sounds so amazing. Good. Right? Yeah. So uh, I guess I've probably ratted myself out as far as the politics go. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would love to do that. And I've, you know. I want to make another film, and I, I don't think that that's the thing that I can make right now, mm-hmm. but I've got this other thing that I'm writing that is a single location thriller. It's more of a haunted house. takes place in one location. Oh, that's awesome. Mm. Yeah. Dude, those are my favorite kind of movies, honestly. Like, more character-based. Less. Have you on. seen The Night House? The Night House? I don't the think The Night so. House just came out. It's pretty boss. Did y'all ever play a video game called Super Liminal? Yes. I <laughs> okay, yeah, that's, right that's on. Amazing. Okay. Yes, I did. Okay, so imagine concepts of super liminal as a horror film. Oh my god, I I know. Ex- yeah, exactly. Like what? Yeah, it's all about architecture and this woman whose husband just killed himself. He was an architect, and she lives at this house on a lake. And on the other side of the lake, she finds a mirror house which is literally a mirror image of her house oh my God. built on the other side of the lake by her deceased husband. That sounds amazing. So there's all these architectural shots that are really scary. Good stuff. It's not too long. It's pretty interesting. Scared me pretty good. Dude, huh. that's going right on my list. Thank you for the all recommendation. Right. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate it. Is there anything else that you guys want to ask Eric Vale? I don't know. Of course. Um, (laughs) Waste this opportunity. (laughs) Yeah, really appreciate you spending the time. I would not have imagined that you play video games because I just imagine you're constantly Uh, like super liminal. It's such a niche, like indie hit. That's amazing. That's my kind of jam. Like, I like those kinds of puzzle games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. When we're done here, I'm going to go in there and crank up Far Cry 6. But of course. Yeah. uh, (laughs) But yeah, I love those. I love those puzzle games, man. I grew up on Myst, and that was like that was the first video yeah. game I ever played, and I, that series followed me through uh, life, basically. Yeah, I love that kind of stuff. That's awesome. It's so fantastic. If you ever want to do uh, an Eric Vale hates Robotech podcast, please let us know. I do. We'd be we'd be willing to go back through that series for you. Yeah, I would fucking be down for for any of this. That's yeah. awesome. That's great to yeah. hear. Because Robotech is one that I miss. Like, I've known of it, but I've never gone back through and watched it. So Same. that would be, yeah. it'd be really I don't think cool. I have either. I mean, I, re- uh, you know, I remember it and I'm certain I haven't watched it in my adulthood. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what Eric hates Dragon Ball Z is all yeah. about. Like, John and I are going back through and just like saying, is this actually a good show? Yeah. Like weighing it against our childhood sort of like infatuation mm-hmm. with it. And we're just peeling it apart as much as possible. Like, yeah. okay, this voice line wasn't the most fantastic, but this next one was the best one that I've heard today. Yeah. And then Which the good news is, is Trunks we've loved. Oh yeah, the very best arc. Yeah, pretty much universally. That we went over so. is the one with you in it. I don't know if that's coincidental or oh, not. Oh, guess. I, I mean, I hope not. I hope <laughs> that you just like it better, it's- but I'll take whatever. <laughs> I don't know if it's because of you, but it's really good. It is. It's, it's pretty damn I'm sure good. it's not. Yeah. Because of you. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much for uh, joining us. I don't know. Yeah. Is there anything else we want to cover? I don't know. I Seriously. Thanks for taking the time. Like yeah. this was. Uh, I, it's unbelievable fantastic. that you're on this show. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you. Oh, for- man. It's my pleasure, man. It's been h- hilarious. <laughs> Seriously. So much fun.
Yeah, if you could uh, just let a, let uh, anybody else know that um, we don't ask the typical Dragon uh, anime questions about Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, for sure. Or you don't have to. You can keep it between us. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. it's a secret between friends. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll send some fun people your way. <laughs> oh, no, no fucking nerds. <laughs> Thank you, because like tirelessly, yeah. we've been trying to get rid of them. You know, they keep sending oh, us fan God. mail and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, I don't know how I, you deal with it. Oh, tell me about yeah, it. Yeah, it's ridiculous. No, I'm like the biggest nerd. I hate it. <laughs> Yeah, us too. I hate who I am. <laughs> Dude, thank you so much Thanks, for yeah. joining us. This has been fucking amazing. Yeah, it's awesome. um, way more time really fun. Deserve. Feel My free. Pleasure, guys. Yeah, feel free to jump in whenever you want. Uh, but we won't keep you from your family anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because well, mainly I'm hungry. Yeah, yeah I'm exactly. Hungry. Yeah, yeah, us too. <laughs> cool guys. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Dude, I appreciate it. Of course. Again, anytime. For literally. Sure. Oh, I'm going to take you up on that shit. Man. <laughs> <laughs>